Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our Astronomy 102 series. I'm Okte, a science educator from Science Center Singapore. Unfortunately, the weather nowadays has been pretty bad, so we cannot have a live telescope viewing tonight. Also, we are unsure of when the Science Center Observatory will be permitted to open after the end of the circuit breakup, but we will do our best to bring the experience of stargazing to you online. We have a special episode today titled Earth and the Planets because planets are starting to become a prominent part of our night sky soon from mid-July onwards. For tonight, Jupiter will begin to rise at 11.04. It will probably be too near the horizon for us to see until around midnight. Saturn will join us in the early night sky from July onwards and Mars in October. While we are looking forward to seeing these celestial objects in our night sky, let's learn a little bit more about these planets. For this broadcast, I will be bringing everyone on a journey through our solar system and come up close to the planets around us. We are starting off from a familiar place, a place you and I have spent all our life on, Earth. I hope you are ready and let's begin our journey. We are starting off with the innermost planet of our solar system, Mercury. Named after the Roman god of messenger, it is the fastest of all our planets, taking only 88 days to make a complete orbit around the sun. Looking at it, it shares some similarity with the moon, with all the cradles visible on its surface. Why is that so? That's because Mercury's atmosphere has long been ripped away by the sun. Atmosphere here on Earth protects us by burning out asteroids before it collides with the surface. Without an atmosphere, asteroids are free to bombard the surface of Mercury, leaving behind craters like the ones you are looking at now. Being the closest planet to the Sun, we can expect Mercury to be burning hot. Temperature on the surface of this planet facing the Sun goes above 400 degrees Celsius. In comparison, water boils at only 100 degrees Celsius. However, the temperature on this side that is facing away from the Sun can get very, very cold. Temperature here goes below negative 170 degrees Celsius, so it can be said that Mercury is a planet of extreme hot and cold. Why is that so? We will answer this question shortly. Despite Mercury being the closest planet to the Sun, it is not the hottest. The hottest planet will actually be our next, our next destination, Venus. And here we are at Venus. Venus is named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Some of you might notice a bright spot in the sky during either the, uh, the late evening or the early morning. And that is probably Venus, the second brightest natural object in the night sky after the moon. Being the hottest planet, its temperature in the day goes above 450 degrees Celsius. Even at night, this temperature barely changes at all. And this extreme temperature, both day and night, is due to the atmosphere of Venus. More than 95% of the atmosphere of Venus is made up of carbon dioxide. As many of you know, carbon dioxide is what we call a greenhouse gas. And it is actually causing the planet to trap a lot of the sun's heat. If you remember about Mercury, the lack of atmosphere on Mercury allows the sun's heat to escape, causing it to be freezing cold at night. But that does not happen here at Venus. And what you are looking at now, this is not the surface of Venus. Venus is always surrounded by thick layers of clouds, and these clouds are not the same as what you see every day. These clouds are made out of sulfuric acid, highly corrosive substance that can even melt metal. So to take a better look at the surface of Venus, let's remove this layer of clouds surrounding Venus. 
So you see this reddish surface. This is the surface of Venus. Venus is probably the most hostile planet to human life. And there are three reasons for it. The first two has been mentioned before. It's high temperature and the cloud of sulfuric acid. The third reason is its atmospheric pressure. Pressure on Venus is approximately 90 times that of the Earth. So any man on Venus without protective gears would find himself crushed by the air around him. The next planet in line would definitely be Earth, but we are not ready to return yet. Instead, let's skip Earth and proceed to Mars. Here we are. Mars is named after the Roman god of war. It is often referred to as the red planet and I believe the reason why is pretty obvious. Mars is visible in our early night sky from October onwards and you should be able to see its slightly red, reddish color using only your eyes. Scientists are actually very eager to explore Mars as a potential place for humans to migrate and stay. The reason why has got to do with its color. The surface of Mars is covered by this red substance known as iron oxide or rust. Rust forms when there is both oxygen and water, both of which is essential for life. This rust on Mars suggests that there used to be both oxygen and water present in the past. Mars has many interesting features on it as well. So right now you're looking at these four pimple-like structure on Mars. Those are actually volcanoes. The largest one is called Olympus Mons. It has a height of nearly 22 kilometers, more than twice the height of Mount Everest. The presence of volcano tells us that in the past, Mars used to have a layer of liquid magma running below its surface, similar to what we have on Earth right now. If we move a little bit more to the right hand side, we can see these cracks that runs across the surface of Mars. This cracks is a system of canyons providing further proof of tectonic activities on Mars in the past. The name is called Valleys Marineris in Latin, meaning the Valley of the Marinas. Its length extends over 4,000 kilometers, its width 200 kilometers, and its depth 7 kilometers. Although Mars is a small planet as compared to the Earth, its features are certainly not small. Many plans have been made to land men on Mars, yet none. Has, to, has yet to be carried out. However, it is very likely that we will see men set out on this seven-month journey on Mars, to land on Mars within our lifetime. Mars is the last of what we call terrestrial planets or rocky planets. Beyond Mars, we will move through the asteroid belt and come face to face with our first gas giant, the largest planet in our solar system, Jupiter. So we are currently looking at the dark side of Jupiter, the side that is away from the sun. It will be moving over to the day side soon. Yes, there we are. So Jupiter is named after the Roman god of the sky and thunder, the king of gods. A name fitting for this planet here, which is the largest that orbits our sun. Jupiter will be visible in the early night sky from mid-July onwards, and it's made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. This means that Jupiter probably doesn't have a surface that we can land on. We are going to look at two key features of Jupiter here today. The first is the color bands running across the surface of Jupiter. These bands are actually clouds moving in opposing directions, generating wind speed of up to 360 kilometers per hour. With such speeds, we can expect storms on Jupiter unlike anything we will ever see on Earth. And this brings me to the next feature, commonly known as the Great Red Spot. So right in the middle of Jupiter, now slightly to the top, you can see this eye-like object staring at you. That is the Great Red Spot. And it is actually a storm on Jupiter. How was this storm formed? Through this, we have no idea. 
It has always been there since the first observation of Jupiter was made. However, what we do know is that it has been growing smaller and smaller as time passes. When we first calculated its size in the late 1800s, its size is about six Earths placed side by side. Now, it has the size of about two Earths. Both the color bands and the great red spot can be seen using a ground-based telescope. So when the Science Center Observatory reopens, come on down and allow us to show you these details in real life. Another key feature of Jupiter isn't really located on the planet, but rather around it, orbiting it. I'm referring to the moons of Jupiter, and we shall pay for them a quick visit. So right here, you can see the four moons. The first moon we will be visiting is the one closest to Jupiter, and that is Io. So over here, we have Io. You can see Jupiter in the background as well. Right, Io is this yellowish looking moon with a lot of black marks on it. Right, these black marks, they are actually volcanoes. And Io is the most volcanic body in our entire solar system. As it turns out, volcanoes are not limited to planets, but moons as well. Being so close to Jupiter, the core of Io is always being stretched and pulled by the strong gravity of Jupiter, causing it to melt and producing magma. Io is probably not a place we want to be at for long, so let's move on to our next moon, Europa. So looking at this moon, right, it has a slightly whitish color. There are some lines, as you can see, running across its surface. So what do you think this moon is made up of? If your answer is ice, you are right. Europa is a moon of ice. And scientists believe that underneath this ice, there is an ocean of liquid water. Plans are being made to send orbiters to Europa to search for evidence of life. And who knows what we might find there underneath these thick layers of ice. Until then, okay, we will be leaving Europa and visiting our next moon, Ganymede. So all the moons of Jupiter are really interesting. Ganymede, what's so special about this moon here? Ganymede holds the title of the largest moon in our solar system. Okay, in fact, Ganymede is larger than the planet Mercury itself. And there is no doubt that if Ganymede orbits our sun independently, it will definitely be considered a planet. However, during its formation, it has been captured by the gravity of Jupiter and therefore it can only be classified as a moon. Right. The last moon we are going to is the furthest of these four moons and its name is Callisto. And here we are at Callisto. So what's so special about Callisto? If we go in closer to Callisto, you can see that the whole surface is littered with spots, right? These spots that you see on Callisto's are actually cradles. Callisto holds the title of being the most heavily cradled body in our entire solar system. It is so heavily cradled that should there be a new cradle forming now on Callisto, it will have to be on top of an older one. These four moons that we have paid a quick visit to, they are known collectively as the Galilean moons, named after the astronomer Galileo Galilei, who discovered them at around 1610. At that time, it is widely believed that everything revolves around Earth. And these four moons were the first objects found to orbit a planet other than Earth. These four moons, they are actually visible through the telescope. So if you have a chance to look at Jupiter through the telescope, take note of these four bright star-like objects right, forming a straight line around Jupiter. Those are probably these four moons of Jupiter. 
So enough of this detour, let's head back to the planets and visit Saturn next, shall we? So over here we have Saturn, probably one of the most recognizable planets that we have due to its distinct ring system around it. It will be visible in the early night sky from mid-July onwards and it's named after the god of agriculture. The composition of Saturn is similar to Jupiter, made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. As for the rings, usually we often imagine it as one continuous ring running around it. That is slightly incorrect because if we, look, if we take a close look at it through a telescope or over here on this um, live stream, we can see that there are distinct gaps Right, so the ring system of Saturn is actually made up of three main rings with a distinct gap running between it. These rings, they are actually made up of small pieces of rock and ice. I said small in comparison to other things out in our space, but these rocks and ice can vary between the size of a grain of sand to the size of houses. So in 2019, just last year, right, Saturn gained a new title. I believe a lot of you know about that. The title is known as the King of the Moon. 20 new moons have been found orbiting Saturn, bringing the total number of Saturn's moon to 82. Jupiter has 79 moons, so it has since lost that title. And this actually tells us how little we know about our own solar system while we are looking far and wide for different things out in space. The next two planets we will be visiting are very similar and is often referred to as gas giants. The first one is Uranus. So Uranus is the only planet not named after a Roman god. Instead, it is named after the Greek god of the sky. Unlike Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus actually has a core in the middle of the planet made up of ice, hence its classification as an ice giant. First thing that caught your eyes about Uranus is probably its light blue color, a really, really unique color to planets. And this is due to Uranus having methane, which tends to absorb red light and reflects blue light from the sun, giving it its distinct color. Now, before we proceed over to Neptune, I want to remind you to remember this color of Uranus because we will be doing a small little comparison later on. So, looking at Neptune now, both Uranus and Neptune, they are blue in color, but which one has a darker shade of blue? Right? I believe your answer should be Neptune. And why is that so? Well, that's because even though Neptune is made up of similar chemicals as compared to Uranus, so mainly hydrogen, helium, and methane, Neptune has a lot more methane than Uranus. Because of that, okay, Neptune is able to reflect more blue light, absorb more red light, and hence the darker blue scene right here. Scientists is able to tell a lot about a planet simply by looking at it, looking at what kind of color is it giving out, looking at what wavelength of light it is giving out. By the way, Neptune is named after the Roman god of the sea. Another interesting fact about Neptune is that this is the planet that is not found by sight. We did not see it. Then how is it found? It's actually found by mathematics. When astronomers look at Uranus in the past, they realized that the orbital path of Uranus seems to change slightly. They then predict that perhaps there is another planet further out than Uranus pulling it away from its original, original path. Calculations were made, and when the telescope was pointed at the position of this unknown planet, they found Neptune. Back in the days, we used to have nine planets, but now we only have eight. So what happened to this last planet? The last planet is actually Pluto. I believe a lot of you still remember it. So since we are already so far out, right near the edge of our solar system, might as well pay Pluto a visit.
so we are really really close to the edge of our universe now or rather our, our solar system now right and we have Pluto over here so why is Pluto considered a dwarf planet rather than a planet today well that's because recently astronomers decide to add three conditions right for something to be called a planet the first condition is that it has to orbit around the Sun from what we know Pluto do orbit around our Sun although its orbital path is slightly different from the rest the second condition is that that object has to be round Pluto is round from what we know so what happens to the third condition well the third condition is that that object has to be able to clear its orbital path as it goes around the Sun and Pluto is simply not big enough for its gravity to clear its own orbital path of other objects hence it can only be considered a dwarf planet but nevertheless there are still debates going on on whether we should classify Pluto as a dwarf planet so sometime in the future maybe Pluto will be reclassified as a planet instead so from here since we are already at the, near the edge of our solar system we will be taking a look back at Earth right can you see Earth let's take a look do you think you're able to see Earth well the answer is not really right so in 1990 the Voyager 1 space probe was leaving our solar system and before it did it actually turned around and took a final look at Earth then it snapped a photo and sent it back to us Earth in that picture was less than a pixel among the vastness of space and accompanying this photograph was a famous quote from Carl Sagan an astronomer we will be playing the code for you, so sit back and enjoy. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits 
than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. With this, let's begin our journey back to Earth. Let's answer some questions from the comment section since we still have some time here. Okay, the first question is um, if we can see Setna, the dwarf planet. Okay, I, I already requested our pilot to try to fly us there. Okay, we, can, we will try our best to bring Setna over here to you, but we'll have to see if our system allows that to be done. Okay, second question. The, the iron on Mars, the rust on Mars, is it, um, this is a little technical, is it Fe203 or Fe302, right? So, the iron on Mars is actually iron 3 oxide, which is Fe203. Uh, it's a very specific um, compound of iron that is formed and has this very distinct color, right? So what software do we use to visualize these planets? Okay, this program that we are using is called Starry Night, but there are some other programs out there that you might be interested in using. Okay, um, there's a question asking why is the, um, the axis of rotation of Uranus different? So most of our planets rotate along the same axis, right? But Uranus axis is almost 90 degrees off. Why is that so? Truth is, we don't know, right? There are a few theories around it, or rather the most accepted theory that we have is that in the past, during the formation, an Earth-like planet actually collided with Uranus. And this collision is so strong, it knocked Uranus off its original axis of rotation. Which is why now it seems to be rotating um, sideways as res with respect to how we see things on Earth. Okay. All right. So um, there's one question that will be a little long. So our moon. Okay. So what actually forms our moon? Um, in the past, the original theory is that the moon actually came from the Earth. So if you look at our world map, you realize that there is a space that is very, very empty, right? The Pacific Ocean. So the first theory was that the Earth itself was spinning so fast it threw the moon into space. That, okay, from what we know now, is not really possible. Okay, that's, it's really, really difficult for Earth to spin that fast. So what happens is there's a second theory that comes up that the moon might have actually came from somewhere else they flew into our solar system and they get captured by the gravity of Earth. And what happens is during the Apollo missions, when astronauts went up to Moon, they collected some samples from the Moon. When they brought the sample back to Earth and they went to check it, okay, in these samples there are, or rather in, in, in science, we have this thing called isotopes. The isotopes of a planet is basically its signature, right? So it turns out that the amount of isotopes on Moon is about the same as it is on Earth, which means that the moon couldn't possibly come from somewhere else. It's really, really unlikely that something coming from far away would have the same compound as what we have on Earth, right? So there comes the third theory, which is the most accepted one today. So the third theory actually states that in the past, there used to be a collision between a mass like object with Earth during the early, for early formation stage of Earth. This collision okay, actually threw a chunk of Earth into space, right? And this chunk, okay, starts to collapse into a circular form and starts to orbit around Earth, which is what we call the moon today, right? The truth might or might not be one of these theories. Uh, we are still learning a lot about our solar system and about space itself. So maybe in the future, there are better theories to explain the formation of moon. But as of now, this is the best we can do, okay? Right, so I don't think we are able to see the dwarf planet. 
So, oh, Senna, oh, so apparently just now we managed to display Senna for a short while, which I happen to miss. But nevertheless, okay, so next question, what is Saturn's dust ring made of? I assume the dust ring refers to the ring system around Saturn, right? So most of the, most of the ring system is made up of um, rocks or ice. Small rocks or ice, right? So what is the size? It can vary between the size of a grain of sand to the size of a house. So you might not want to be too close to it because um, speed in space goes a little crazy. Okay, things get very, very fast. So even a grain of sand, right? If you actually try to Google it, can cause huge damage to even the International Space Station. So um, please stop going so close to the ring. It's not very, very safe here. Right, where did... Okay, I have another question that I can't really read. Why, where, why did space from? I would assume it's asking about how is space formed? So, um, theory is that, or rather the calculation shows that at the start, there is this um, incident called the Big Bang, right? And during the Big Bang, okay, the whole universe itself is created. And even now, the universe is actually expanding, so it's growing bigger and bigger. Space itself is growing bigger and bigger. So, it's really, really unlikely that no matter how technologically advanced we are, we can explore the whole universe because while we are trying to find out more about the universe, okay, we can't um, we can't travel faster than the speed of light, and the expansion is happening near the speed of light. So there is forever more things to find out than what we have already found out. Okay, can we go back in time to see the collision? Okay, we are actually planning an episode of vodcast on that. So stay tuned to us. Okay, in our future episodes, we will show you how this um, collision occurs okay, to form the moon. All right. So I think that's all for the questions. So if you have any questions that you would like answered in our future episodes, okay, you can always tell us about them in the comment section so that we can plan our broadcast according to what you would like to know. Okay. I hope you have enjoyed yourself on this trip around our solar system. Thank you for joining us here tonight and we promise to bring you the stargazing um, experience online until the Science Center Observatory reopens, even though we are still unsure of when that will happen. Remember to like us on our Facebook page so you can stay up to date with the events happening at the Science Center Observatory. I would also like to extend my thanks to my colleague, Li Fei, for piloting us around space. So she's the one that is in charge of all the movements of this program that you see. Ji Hang for the technical support and Kang Hui for answering the audience question in the comment section. Our next broadcast will be on next Friday at 4.30 p.m. The topic of discussion will be on our universe, and I hope to see all of you there. With that, I've come to the end of today's broadcast, and I wish everyone to stay home, stay safe, and keep looking up.